As many of you know, we've been traveling through the book of Genesis, and I just kind of want to bring us up to speed here just real fast before we dive into this chapter. But Genesis chapter 1 through 11, we find the creation, we find the fall of Adam, we find the flood, we find the Tower of Babel. Those are the main scenes that happen between Genesis chapter 1 through 11. And then from Genesis chapter 12 all the way through 50 are really about four people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. And for the sake of this book, I'm just going to include Joseph in with them four, with them three as the patriarchs. So we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. What's very interesting is these four characters, as you study chapters 12 all the way through 50, there's a great emphasis on Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph. Isaac is not emphasized as much. We find in Genesis chapter 22, after Isaac is born and he's a lad, so he's probably a teenager at, at best, and Abraham takes him up to, to the mountain to sacrifice him as God has commanded him to do so. We find that God says, I'm going to provide my own lamb. And all that was typifying and looking into the future about how Jesus Christ would come into the world and be slain on the cross. And then... We find some other situations where Abraham commands his servant to go out and find a wife for Isaac. And Isaac is married. Abraham dies. And we find that Isaac has two children, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is going to be really the, the, great, the great man that will eventually have 12 children. And those individuals will be the 12 tribes of Israel. And Esau is the man whose descendants will be the Edomites. And as we come to Genesis chapter 26, what's interesting is you study the life of Abraham, you study the life of Jacob, and you study the life of Joseph, you find there's many chapters in the book of Genesis that emphasize them specifically without any other characters. But this is the only chapter in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, that is solely about Isaac. Isaac's mentioned in a few chapters here, but here the focus, the one time in Isaac's life, the spotlight is on him. And what we find is something very interesting. As I've studied this chapter, I would like to label my thoughts with these four words. Like father, like son. Like father, like son. It's interesting to note that many times a man makes a decision and his children will most likely make a very similar decision. And as we look at this chapter, we're going to observe two things in Isaac's life. Verses 1 through 11, we'll observe Isaac's iniquity. And then verses 12 through 35, we'll observe Isaac's prosperity. So we find that in verses 1 through 11, after God gives to him the reassurance and, and calls to remembrance of how God blessed and God made a covenant with Abraham, then we find that Isaac sins. And then after all that transpires, we find that Isaac is, um, he is ridiculed, if you will. He is uh, rebuked by the king Abimelech. And then we see he is prospered and God prospers him in a mighty way. Will you come with me as we look through this chapter? Verse 1 speaks of a famine. Now, if you know anything about the life of Abraham, you know that Abraham did go down into that land because of a famine. And this was a different scene in, in Isaac's life. And it says that Isaac went into Abimelech. Now, if you know anything about the life of Abraham, Abraham is, is known for meeting with this guy named Abimelech. And we have every reason to believe that this is not the same Abimelech. Because it was about 97 to 100 years ago when, on this time period. From this time period that is being written, you go back about 100 years. And then you have the Abimelech that Abraham dealt with. So it has to be a different one more than likely, most likely. So Isaac goes to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. So remember that city, Gerar. Verse number two says, the Lord appears to Isaac and he says, do not go down to Egypt. Now, as you study the word of God, you know that Egypt sometimes and in many cases in God's word is known as a type of the world just because of the sinfulness that they were involved in and all the different things that transpired there. So God commands Isaac not to go down. 
Abraham made a mistake by going down into Egypt. God did not necessarily want him to go down, so Abraham did that, uh, we believe, a couple times. And then God tries to warn Isaac not to do the same thing. And he says, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. And he says in verse number 3, sojourn in this land. Or in other words, as the young people like to say, well, why don't you hang out over here in this territory? And it says, and I will be with thee. He says, I will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. You remember back in the book of Genesis, God promises Abraham a covenant of land, a jurisdiction, area that he would eventually obtain. And he says, verse 4, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. It's the same thing that God told Abraham. So God is reassuring to Isaac that his promise is going to be carried out through him. And he says, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed, this is a direct reference to the Messiah, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? You ever wondered why? Well, verse 5 gives the answer. Because Abraham obeyed God's voice. So, it's interesting that even in the midst of the sin that Isaac is about ready to commit, God is still going to do the things that he desires to do because Abraham obeyed his voice. God said, Abraham, I want you to leave your land, go to this other land, this other territory, which you know nothing about. It's not under your culture. It's nothing. And he goes and he sojourns. So he's, he's kind of like a nomad going from place to place to place to place to place with no stability to a certain extent. And he obeyed God's voice. And because Abraham obeyed and hearkened to God's voice, he says, I'm going to multiply your seed by the stars of heaven, and I'm going to give you a land. Now, verse 6, the Bible says that Isaac dwelled in Gerar. So this is the area in which the Philistine king of Abimelech had jurisdiction over. And by the way, Verse number 6 of, of Genesis chapter 26 is a very short verse. So if you have problems memorizing verse of Scripture, here's one that has one, two, three, four, five words. So you can always memorize this one. It says, And the men of the place asked him of his wife. Now here we find Isaac's iniquity. Not about his wife necessarily, but, but you remember in the, earlier in the book of Genesis, what did Abraham do when he walked into some of these lands? He said, Hey, Sarah. We're going to tell these people that you're my sister. Which was a partial truth because Sarah was Abraham's half-sister, but she was also his wife. And this happened twice. And here, like father, like son, Isaac makes the same mistake. He says, And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. Now, I've done as much research as I could possibly discover, and... Please correct me after the service if I'm wrong, or maybe if you know, raise your hand right now. But I cannot find any resource that proves that Rebecca was a half-sister or a sister of Isaac. They might have been distant relatives, but they were not half-brothers and sisters. And here we find that Isaac deliberately lies to these people. And the reason why is found in this verse 7. For he feared to say, She is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. So, Rebekah was apparently a very beautiful woman to look upon. And he was afraid that he walks into this area where the Philistines are, and Abimelech the king, they're going to see her, and they're just going to kill him. So we find that, that in, in, in this area, Isaac sins by lying to Abimelech. Verses 1 through 5, we observe God's covenant with Isaac, which was really God's covenant with Abraham, and then he just reassures it's going to happen through him. Verses 6 through 9, we read about Isaac lying to Abimelech. And I'm here to remind us all, just as we learned back in Abraham's situations, a... Partial truth is a whole lie. And here we find that a lie is a lie no matter what the motive is. It's a lie. And the Bible says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. 
<laughs> you know, I was talking to some people one day years ago, and they said, you know, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not lie. It says thou shalt not bear false witness. And I'm like, well, hey, it's, it's the same thing. And in fact, bearing a false witness takes it even a further step. So if I deliberately lie to you, it would be like me, like Isaac saying this is my sister when, hey, not even close to his sister. But also, bearing a false witness is what Abraham did. And he said, hey, she is my sister. Which she was a half-sister, was a partial truth, and just not the whole truth. So bearing a false witness gives more than a connotation of just downright lying. It can be deception to deceive and try to, to not tell the entire truth. And that's what Isaac is doing here. And as we look at this passage, what I like about this example is that the perfect God can use imperfect people. <laughs> the perfect God can use imperfect people. And even though Isaac sinned and Abraham sinned against God, God still reached out his hand and used them to further his will. So I'm thankful today that, hey, hey, we've all told a lie before. We may, we may not have stood in front of President Obama and said a downright cold turkey lie to him. Kind of like what, uh, what uh, Isaac does here in this text with, with this king. But nonetheless, we have all said a little white lie here or there, or a full lie, if you will. So, may God help us to be reminded that lying is sin against God, and may God help us to tell the truth. Verse 8 says, It came to pass that when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. You know, I, I'm, real, I, I'm into sports like some of you are. And what's interesting is sometimes you, we talk about sports and we ask, you know, I've done this with young people sometimes. I was like, can you name any verses of Scripture that talk about sports or use the term sport. And here we find one example. This term sport is used throughout the Old Testament on numerous occasions. Then in the New Testament, we find Paul likens the Christian life to a race, to like a marathon. So sports uh, were used in those societies. But here, sporting is not what you and I think of sporting. It's not the Atlanta Braves playing the Baltimore Orioles. It's not the New York Giants playing, uh, you know, the Washington Redskins. It's not this type of sporting. Here, in this context, it's, 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 it's a kind of like a way that a husband would have with his wife and just they're out, you know, having a good time. And they're, they're doing these things. And Abimelech says, hey, hey, if this is your sister, then why are you, you know, doing this with your wife? Or excuse me, with, with your sister. And Abimelech called Isaac and he says, Behold, of a surety she's your wife. How says thou she's my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. So here sporting just simply gives the connotation of, not, not the sports that we're talking of, but, you know, just the way that a man and a wife would maybe hold hands together or hug or do those types of things. Okay? And here Abimelech says, hey, this has definitely got to be your wife, not your sister. And so for this reason, we read in verses 10 and 11, Abimelech rebukes Isaac. And he says, what is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lied with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Verses 1 through 11 speaks of Isaac's iniquity. And his iniquity was lying. So may God help us not to lie, no matter the motive behind it. Verses 12 through 35, there's a different emphasis here, the kind of the scene transitions, and it speaks of Isaac's prosperity. Oftentimes, in our Christian New Testament mindset, and even through the, the Old Testament, when somebody sins against God, you automatically assume that, hey, the cursing of God is going to thunder down upon them. And yes, that does happen. 
But in this case, uh, the Bible doesn't really necessarily say here, but at some point between verses 11 and 12, there was a transition. There it was a break here. I firmly believe that. And perhaps Isaac, you know, got things right with God at some point between these occurring events. Nonetheless, the Bible doesn't say you kind of have to read it between the lines there. But it's very interesting. You would think that after reading verses 1 through 11, that Isaac wouldn't be blessed with prosperity. So please, you know, some of these crazy quacks that you might see on TV might would come to this passage and say, hey, you know, Isaac lied about his wife to Abimelech, so it's going to be okay for me to lie, and God's going to bless me with great prosperity. Please don't make that hermeneutical flaw. Verse number 12 through 14 reveals Isaac becomes wealthy like his father Abraham. So you got to keep in mind, this chapter is all about like father, like son. So it says, Then Isaac sowed in that lamb and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. So they began to get jealous because Isaac began to get wealthy. He sowed some, some things, some crop in the land and reaps that. He reaps a huge harvest. And God just blesses him. And let me just say this, that it is always evident who has the blessing of God upon their life. And here in this situation, I firmly believe, after studying this passage, that God's hand of blessing was upon Isaac because of his father Abraham. Verses 12 through 14 talked about Isaac becomes wealthy like his father Abraham. But notice in verses 15 through 23, we have a, a unique transition here about the wells. And Isaac just simply handles a dispute about the wells with the natives in this land. So check it out. Look at verse 15. It says, For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with the earth. So just imagine... Your, let's just take, for instance, your dad. Let's just assume your dad goes out and hires some help, and they build all these wells for the people in the Roanoke County to be able to use. And then some people come in after several years, and they take dirt, and they clog up those wells to where you can't use them. Well, that's exactly what's going on here. And Isaac comes on the scene, and they begin to, to build some of these wells again. And he says, And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. So the, these Philistines began to, to get jealous and envious, and they outgrew them, apparently, most likely, possibly, and they became mighty. And so he says, leave. And so Isaac departs. He, he um, sets up a tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So these, you got to keep in mind, these folks were nomadic people. So when, let me just say this. Let me pause here for a moment. Um, at universities and in scholarship, you're going to get into these debates about there's not a lot of tangible evidence for these group of people, these people that, that will eventually be called Israelites, roaming around all the world. There's not a, lot, a, whole, a whole lot of evidence supporting this kind of notion that the Bible displays here. But you've got to keep in mind, nomads don't carry a lot of stuff because they don't own a whole lot of stuff. All they have is, you know, their animals, their food, and a little bit of clothing and a tent to set up. And so that's what they have here. So you've got to keep in that mind. And when a skeptic comes to, to challenge you on that, you've got to be able to defend that with those types of statements. So he departs, they go, and they're dwelling in these lands. And verse 18 says, Isaac did, digged again the wells of water. So they came, they stopped them up, the Philistines did. And Isaac goes in and starts to redig these wells. And sometimes, um, just like in the ministry, we have to get back out in that field and redig. Sometimes we have to get back in the field, the harvest field, and plow that ground again 
because sin and the opposition towards God's Word has come and just flattened out the group of Christians that used to be there. So sometimes we have to go in and work again. If you were to go back 300 years ago, or really, maybe even 100 years ago, the concept of missionaries going to Europe and the United Kingdom and England was, was a, a far cry. You crazy talk. It's like missionaries in the United States of America? 50 years ago, you'd be like, well, you done lost your mind. But now, hey, we're sending missionaries to Europe, the United Kingdom, and let's just face it, we need missionaries in the United States today. Because the Word of God, the harvest field, is becoming rock solid. And we need to get back out there. So here, we can kind of look at this and, and kind of apply that in our own lives. But here, nonetheless, he says, Isaac redigs these wells. They dig in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. Look at verse 19. Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. The herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Isaac, because they strove with him. Now, a lot of commentators have said some things about these different wells, so I'm just going to share with you what they've said. They, so we have mentioned in verse 20, Isaac. Then we have another uh, well, which is mentioned, Sitna. And then we have another well mentioned in verse 22, Rehoboth. Esek, some commentators have noted, stands for contention. Sitna stands for contempt and or enmity. Rehoboth stands for the world's carelessness towards Christ and also plenty of room. I'm not saying I understand all the details going on with these wells, but all I know is that Isaac comes and he redigs them, and there was a little bit of dispute about it. And may I say this? As we look at this text and as we look at a modern, modern Christianity, when we get out into the harvest field and we start digging some wells to try to throw the water of the Word down in there so that people can get saved, you're always going to have opposition. Always. Those who have no opposition aren't sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice on verse 23. The Bible says, And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And right before that, in verse 23, after it mentions that, that third well, he says, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And here during this time period, they dig these wells, and they're having a little bit of dispute about the natives there, and Isaac handles it and with the Lord's help. But now look at verses 24 through 25. As we're looking at Isaac's prosperity, we also see in these next two verses, God confirms His promise to Isaac for Abraham's sake. Notice again, verse 24, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not! For I am with thee, and I will bless thee, and will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Please keep that in mind. For my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there, and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there. And their Isaac's servants digged a well. Here we find God confirms his promise to Isaac on behalf of his father Abraham. And Isaac sets up an altar, and worships God. <laughs> the most prosperous men in the world are those who worship God in spirit and in truth. And that's what we need to get back to. It's just worshiping God. Get the focus off man, and get the focus on God. Whenever our focus is on man, bad things happen. But when our focus is on God... God pours out His Spirit and blessing upon us.
So as we're looking at Isaac's prosperity, we find he became wealthy like his father Abraham. We find this passage talks about him disputing uh, about the wells with the natives. We find that God confirms his promise concerning his father's sake, Abraham. But now look at verses 26 all the way through 31. In these next several verses, we find the natives come and make peace with Isaac because the Lord was with them, just as happened like his father Abraham. Remember, like father, like son. Like father, like son. Like Abraham, like Isaac. Isaac made many similar decisions as his father Abraham did. Some good, some bad. But notice verse 26. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me? and have sent me away from you. Remember earlier in the chapter that, that Abimelech said, you're too great, you're, you know, you gotta, you gotta leave, go from us. Thou much are mightier than we are. He said, leave. And so they responded, we, have certain, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, let there be now an oath between us, even between us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. And they rose up betimes in the morning, and swear one to another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace." Here we find that these verses just relay that the natives come and they make peace with Isaac and his family and his people because they were growing. They were becoming wealthy and mighty and they didn't want to have any threats. Now I want to draw your attention to verses 32 through 33. These next two verses discuss God blesses Isaac in the form of a well. Remember, he just built some wells. Then after they build the wells, you know, they have the dispute with the people. And then the people come and they try to make peace, or they did make peace. And now verse 32 and 33 says, And it came to pass the, the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which he had digged and said unto him, We have found water. Now, let me just tell you something. In this land... Some of these places are very desolate, and it's dry, and it's hot, and it's just hotter than hot can get. And finding water is a miracle from God. And when you're able to drink it, man, it tastes so good. But here they find water. And I begin to think about the day that I drank of the spiritual water of eternal life from the well that Jesus Christ offers from Calvary. He says, verse 33, And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. God blesses Isaac in the form of a well. God has blessed us in a form of a well too. That well is Calvary. That well is, is not water that didn't gush out, but it was the blood of Jesus Christ. And it was His body that was broken, His blood that was shed for you, for me, so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. But now, if you notice this chapter, it's very interesting because the conclusion of this chapter just it seems to not fit with all the events that are transpiring. You've got to keep in mind verses 1 through 5. Um, the first part of the chapter deals with, with Isaac's iniquity. So God comes and He tells him that, hey, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a great land. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed through your seed because of, my, because of Abraham obey my voice. And then he sins. He lies to Abimelech. And then he leaves the land after growing his people and getting some cattle and some food and they dispute the well situation. Then um, God blesses him in the form of a well. But now the very end of the chapter is just something that we all just really need to take note of, especially the young people. It says, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri the Hittite. And Bash Emath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Now notice verse 35, very interesting. 
which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. So because Esau chose to marry, these, this marriage, these, the, this scene brought great grief, sorrow to his parents. So let us keep in mind that it is always best to have your parents' blessing upon the individual that you spend the rest of your life with. So Esau marries and grieves his parents here. We find that God blesses Isaac in the form of a well. We find that the natives make peace with Isaac because the Lord was with them. There's no doubt about it. God confirms His promise to Isaac on behalf of his father Abraham's sake. Isaac handles the dispute about the wells. Isaac becomes a very wealthy individual. And then we find that's all about his prosperity. But then earlier in the chapter, Abimelech rebukes Isaac because of his sin of lying. And God reminded him of his covenant with Abraham. This chapter is all about... Isaac following the footsteps of his father Abraham. Like father, like son. We've looked at Isaac's iniquity and we've looked at Isaac's prosperity. Father, we thank